It's my joy to welcome you once again to Heart of the Shepherd as we continue our chronological study of the scriptures. We are still in the Old Testament, however soon we'll be making our transition to the New Testament. Well, we are currently in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 3 and 4 is our scripture reading for today. I've titled the devotional, Tears of Joy, Tearful Memories, and Facing Adversaries. I do invite you to open your Bible to Ezra 3. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this video channel, but even more important than that is to subscribe to www.ezra.com heartoftheshepherd.com and have these devotionals sent to you in written form as well as follow the daily video. Well, let's do a little background. The book of Ezra marked the end of 70 years of captivity for God's people. Now, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 586 BC. The Lord sent prophets to call the people to repent and encourage them with his promise that they would one day be restored to their land. The majority dismissed the prophets. With Babylon's fall, many despaired of ever seeing Mount Zion. Then Cyrus, the king of Persia, announced, and I quote, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house, that is the temple, at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Ezra chapter 1 and verse 2. Well, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, responded to the announcement, and with certain priests and Levites, they returned to rebuild the temple and Jerusalem in Ezra chapter 2. Now, Ezra 2 chronicled a census of those who returned to Jerusalem and concluded with them arriving in Jerusalem, bearing the offering to the people who remained in Babylon. They brought with them the silver and the gold vessels of the temple, Cyrus released from the treasuries of Babylon. Well, that brings us to Ezra chapter 3. And consider with me, first of all, a shared purpose. Ezra 3, verses 1 through 11. Now, the difficult journey from Babylon to Jerusalem might have taken as much as four months for a, a traveling group of 50,000 people. Now, allowing an additional three months for the people to rebuild their homes, villages, and towns, we then read, and I quote, when the seventh month, this is in Ezra 3 verse 1, when the seventh month was come, that the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Now, setting aside their interests, that is, their personal interests for the sake of the whole, we read in verses 3-5 through five that they worship together, worship together, and finally, sacrifice together. And then verse 10-11, through 11, of course, they rejoice together. Now, consider then a shared sacrifice, verse 6 and 7. And so, they came together, these Jews of the captivity, to Jerusalem, to offer, verse 6, burnt offerings unto the Lord. We read also that they gave money, silver and gold, also unto the masons and to the carpenters, paying them for their labor and meat, that is, from their livestock, and drink from their vineyards and oil, verse 7, from their groves. Now, they recognized then the Lord was the proprietor of everything they possessed. Now, you can do a little bit of the background of contemporary uh, Haggai chapter 2 and verse 8. Now, regarding the shared joy, verses 10 through 11, you know, I've learned that the happiest believers set aside personal interests and agendas for an opportunity to serve the Lord and minister to others. Now, because the people shared a mutual purpose and sacrifice, they shared in the celebration. In verse 10, it was natural then that they rejoiced as one when the final stones of the temple's foundation were laid. Now the priests, we read, wore their finest robes for the celebration and they sounded the shofar, that is the trumpet, and the priests sounded their trumpets and the Levites with cymbals and raised their voices and praised the Lord in verse 10, according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. In fact, the people singing and shouting was so loud that we read in chapter 4 and verse 1 that their voices were heard afar off by their adversaries. 
A closing thought for Ezra 3, verses 12 and 13. Now, unfortunately, there were some that did not share in the joy and celebration when the stones of the temple's foundation were laid. A discordant sound was heard amid the celebration, for we read that certain ancient men, verse 12, these would have been the elderly priests, Levites and tribal leaders, certain elderly men, ancient men, remembered the temple of Solomon before it was destroyed. And perhaps these were men who were very young. Remember like men like Daniel uh, and others were taken into captivity when they were just maybe in their mid-teens, 13, 14, 15 uh, maybe older, and so there were others that were taken captive at that time. So as they come back, they remember from really, I guess I would say a child's point of view, the temple of Solomon. And so comparing that temple to the one that had been built, these people were bent on criticizing. And so we read that uh, they were living in the past and they scoffed at the work that was done. Well, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, we read that the Lord confronted the ancients through his prophet, and he demanded, and I quote, Who hath despised the day of small things? Now, the prophet Haggai echoed Zechariah's sentiment, and he asked, Who is left among you that saw this house, that is the temple, in her first glory? How do you see it now? Verse Haggai chapter 2 and verse 3. Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Now, I doubt the complainers were numbered among those who physically labored on the foundation of the temple. Uh, they were guilty of a sin that I ob observed in many through the years. And it is this. Those who sacrifice little are often the loudest critics. Well, that brings us to Ezra chapter 4. Now, unbeknownst to the people, their adversaries heard the noise of the celebration in chapter 4 and verse 1, and they set about to halt the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra wrote, and I quote, The adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard, that is, they took notice, that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel. Ezra chapter 4. In verse 1. Now I'm going to invite you to consider in verses 1 through 16 four methods the enemy employs to discourage God's people. It's a wonderful lesson for us as well as a historic opportunity of looking on the past and seeing the tactics of enemies. The first you'll notice was a pretense of assimilation, Ezra 4, and verses 1 through 3. And so on a pretense of friendship, the adversaries came to Zerubbabel, whom I believe was identified in Ezra chapter 1, verse 8, by his Babylonian name, Shesbazar, the prince of Judah. And these enemies suggested assimilation. Now, those enemies were part of the Assyrian policy that resettled a conquered land with the people of other nations. They said to Zerubbabel, and I quote, Let us build with you, verse 2, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Eshardon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. And so they acknowledged they were brought into the land of Israel by the Assyrian king. But they, uh, in an insincere fashion, suggested, we'll build with you. We'll seek your God. Well, Zer Zerubbabel and Heshua, joined by, and I quote, the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel, rejected the pretext of assimilation, and they said, and I quote, you have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Ezra 4, verse 3. Then we see the second attempt. The first tactic of discouragement was assimilation. We'll join you. The second tactic was a campaign of aggravation, verses 4 and 5. And so undeterred in their attempt to hinder rebuilding the temple, the enemies began a campaign of aggravation. As time passed, we quote, the people of the land, now those are non-Hebrews, weakened the hands of, 
or that is the resolve of the people of Judah, and they troubled them in building. Now the word troubled is the word they terrified them. And we read in verse 5, and I quote, they hired counselors against them. Now this word counselors would be conspirators or agitators. And so they hired counselors against them, against the people of Judah, to frustrate their person. Well, our purpose. Now, consider, thirdly, an effort of adjudication. And so when assimilation and aggravation fail to hinder, verses 6 through 10, uh, the attempt, the construction of the temple, the enemy turned to adjudication. They sent a letter to the king of Persia and they challenged the legality and the legitimacy of the effort to rebuild the temple, verses 6 through 10. And then, verses 12 through 14, lastly, a tactic to discourage is a charge of accusations. Now, when all else failed, the adversaries of the Jews made a fourth attempt to impede the work on the temple, and they brought false accusations against the Jews and employed two tactics in their spurious charges against the Jews, deception and distortion. Now the enemy endeavored to deceive the king and charge the Jews were rebuilding, quote, the rebellious and bad city, as reported in verse 12. They also distorted their motives and they implied that the Jews were rebuilding the fortress of Jerusalem to the end that they might rebel, verses 13 through 15. Now, the accusations against the Jews were so severe that the king sent a letter to Jerusalem and demanded, verses 23 through 24, that the work cease. Now, the antagonism and unrelenting attacks of their adversaries did discourage the people and eventually halted the work of the temple. Succumbing to spiritual lethargy, it seemed the enemies of Judah and Benjamin succeeded. The construction of the temple, verses 2 through 11, ceased for 15 long years. Now, I, I mentioned verses 2 through 11. You need to turn to Haggai to see the background of that. Haggai chapter 1 and verses 2 through 11. Sadly, the jubilation of Ezra 3 had turned to sorrow and discouragement. Ezra 4 and verse 24. Well, closing thoughts. The faithful servants of the Lord will always have detractors. Unfortunately, some feel their calling is to be critical. However, I have found Critics are usually sitting on the sidelines of ministry. Here's a closing warning. The most effective implement in the devil's toolbox is discouragement. Don't let him discourage you. Well, thank you, my friend, for being a part of Heart of a Shepherd as we continue our study in the book of Ezra. God bless you and bye-bye.